I want to talk about award ceremonies. They are a grand gala. It's an honor just to attend an award ceremony. It's a very special honor and a great achievement to be nominated for an award and then winning the award is what everyone hopes and dreams and works toward even if they act very surprised in their acceptance speech. Oh, I never dreamed that I would get this. They are dreaming of winning the award. <laughs> so we're honored to attend this preliminary short preview of the award ceremony, the induction of these heroes into the Hall of Faith. God rewards his faithful followers. And it's not too early to applaud the saints who are in Hebrews 11. I want to talk about this group of people. They are an inclusive group, not exclusive. Think of who's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Men and women and children, fathers and mothers and brothers, Israelites and a pagan prostitute. There are farmers and shepherds and kings and prophets. There are obedient worshipers, and there are fearful soldiers. These were ordinary people. You know who was characterized as blameless and upright and feared God and turned from evil? Job. He's not in this list. Why not? Another hero of mine is Ezekiel. In his book, it says, and Ezekiel did exactly what the Lord commanded him to do. That is repeated with everything he was told. He's not in this list. So what was it about these people? Why are they chosen as the examples of faithful followers of God for us to follow and imitate? Well, number one, they were just like us. Very simply put, just like us, mortals, sinners, and we are just like they were. So let's keep all that in mind. Number two, they faced temptation. We do too. Number three, they faced discouragements. They had temporary defeats, frequent stumblings. Oops, I can't believe I did that. Oh no. <laughs> they had harsh opposition. These people stumbled, they fell, but they didn't remain down. When they stumbled, when they disobeyed God, they repented and they got back up and they followed and walked with him again. Number four, they had family problems, for one. Some of them had cultural antagonism. Some had physical weakness in one form or another. Some of them had personal insecurities. Some of them had bad reputations. We're going to see more of that in the next set of people that we look at in our homework this coming week. There's not one thing that we can say about these heroes that make them out to be able to walk by faith better than we can. They didn't have something that we don't have. They weren't supernatural. They weren't super special. They were ordinary people. Now we might say, but they heard directly from God. Wait a minute. You've heard directly from God too. And the book we're in started us out and remind, reminded us, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke in various ways to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So we have heard directly from God, from God himself, the God man, Jesus. What other similarities to these people do we have? Number five, they knew God. You could say they were ordinary people who knew their extraordinary God. Number six, they had promises from God, and so do we. 
Number seven, they did not have the fulfillment of promises in hand right there at the moment, but they saw them at a distance and they kept hoping for them. If we look at the lives and the actions of these heroes of faith, we see specific actions that we could imitate, but that's not actually what we are being encouraged to do in the book of Hebrews. Not usually. It, it's true that God could tell someone to build an ark. He told Ken Ham to build an ark. It's in Kentucky now. <laughs> he may tell you to move to a new town like Abraham was sent out. He may tell you to add to your family. But we're going to look at general behaviors of these heroes that we all can imitate. And with an award ceremony in mind, I have created categories of awards. So I will just hand these heroes their awards as we talk about them. So first award is that of worshiping faith. That goes to Abel. Worshiping faith. He had faith in God even though his parents had disobeyed him. Who do you think told Abel about God and the existence of God? Mom and Dad, Adam and Eve. And Abel worshipped God even though his parents had been expelled from the Garden of Eden by God. So he knew the holiness of God. He knew that he was worthy of worship obedience, offering the best to him. Even though his parents had been kicked out of the garden for their disobedience, Abel trusted that he could have fellowship and walk in righteousness and that he could please God. That, that's really a, a big deal to, to realize that he worshipped God rightly when his parents had made that first Original sin. So he did please God. He receives the award of worshiping faith. The next award is that of walking faith, and this goes to Enoch. He was briefly described as one who walked with God, and that's all Genesis says about him. What we understand from that is that he had fellowship with God, and he walked in righteousness. That's part of what it means to walk with God. So that means that he feared God and he turned from evil. That's simple, right? There was no big event. There was no big task for Enoch. But he walked with God one day at a time. One day after another. And when Enoch was 65 years old, he was just a kid in those days, <laughs> and those around him had Lives that were so long, 900 years long. Enoch probably anticipated a very long life. So he kept putting one foot in front of the other and walking with God in obedience and reverence to him. What was life like all around Enoch? Those other people that he lived with. We don't see many details, but I did some math and I have some stories. Uh, statistics for you, and then a statement to go with that. All right, Enoch was 252 years old when his grandson Lamech was born. And he was with Lamech for 113 years before God took Enoch away. All right, so Enoch's 252 years. He lives with his grandson 113 years. His grandson Lamech said in Genesis 5:29, he named his son Noah, for Lamech said, May he bring us relief from our work and the painful labor of farming this ground that the Lord has cursed. Lamech sounds a little bitter. He sounds like he's tired of the hard work. He's not real happy with life. So that's one person that Enoch was closely related to. Life was hard during that time. We also know that Enoch lived among rough, ungodly people because Jude 1, 14 and 15 tells us about him. It says, Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, 
prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Enoch was in the midst of ungodly people, wickedness, those who were rebelling against God. So how did Enoch walk by faith? What did that look like for him? He believed that God is who he says he is. He believed that God would do what he would say he would do. I mean, that's he's prophesying in Jude. God's going to execute judgment on these people. And Enoch walked one day at a time with God, pleasing him. The next award of working faith goes to Noah. Working faith. He had faith in unprecedented circumstances. God gave Noah the promise that something unknown, something unimaginable was about to happen. It's going to rain. Noah had to say, what's rain? Because it had never rained before. There's going to be a flood. What's a flood? <laughs> Don't know. <coughs> Noah was 500 years old when God announced, build an ark and prepare for the flood. Noah worked for 100 years. So now he's 600 years old when he boards the ark. A hundred years just building the ark. One day at a time, year after year, in the midst of the worst wickedness in the world. That is discipline. We are to imitate Noah's faith and patience. We can imitate his discipline. We can imitate his single focus. He didn't get distracted. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So Noah worked by faith every day in the middle of that, and he preached and told them, get ready to get on board. Working faith. The next one who wins the award of extreme faith is Abraham. He had faith and obedience, immediate obedience in response to the command, go. He had faith in the midst of uncertainty. He had faith when he was facing the unknown. Go to a land that I will show you. Abraham did not have a GPS, but he did have God's positioning system. God was his GPS. Abraham had faith while experiencing the disappointment of no child of his own. He had faith with lots of waiting. His greatest act of faith, the extreme faith, shows up the most when he prepared to offer the sacrifice of his son, Isaac. If I were Abraham, I, I would have said, God, this does not make sense. I know I would have said that because I have said that in my life. Like, I, this doesn't make sense to me. So Abraham is an incredible example of faith to me, to have faith in God and obey him, even when it doesn't make sense to me. And another important aspect of Abraham's faith is that he believed that God had something better in store for him. That is so important for us to recognize. For us, God has something better in store. So keep the faith. Now the award for happy faith goes to Sarah. We know she had to learn to trust and obey the hard way because at first she took matters into her own hands and that caused a lot of problems. But when the time came and the angel of the Lord told her that she would have a child, she laughed. Now, this is not the happy laugh. This was actually a laugh of doubt. And God called her out on this. I want to read this passage to you from Genesis 18, 9 through 15. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, Abraham answered. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. 
Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So she laughed to herself. After I have become shriveled up and my Lord is old, will I have delight? But the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you. And in about a year, she will have a son. Sarah denied that she laughed. I did not laugh, she said, because she was afraid. And God replied, no, you did laugh. (laughs) So how is Sarah an example of faith to us? Should we laugh at God's promises? No. There's no record in scripture of what Sarah and Abraham talked about that night (laughs) under the stars or in the tent before they were going to bed or after their visitors left. But one of them may have said something like, let's make a baby. Sarah obviously knew Abraham in the biblical sense of knowing. And that was probably her act of faith. One commentator said, regarding the faith of Sarah, the writer to the Hebrews can see faith where most people would not see it. So the Holy Spirit has led the author of Hebrews to tell us that Sarah had faith and it was related to the birth of Isaac. And then she certainly did have happy faith when she saw she was pregnant. She's going to have a baby. And she had happy and thankful faith when she was holding Isaac in her arms. The next word I'm calling blind faith. This is for Isaac. He expressed his faith when he blessed Jacob. He was looking forward and passing on the promise that God had given. Isaac believed that God would keep his promise that he had spoken to his father, Abraham, and that God had repeated to him. God told Isaac this would be the covenant and this is what you will receive, your descendants will receive. Isaac believed God's covenant of land and seed, descendants, and blessing on the people. Isaac owned no land, so he had not seen any hint of fulfillment of this promise yet. Isaac only had two sons. That was not descendants more than the stars at this point. But he trusted that God would bless. Isaac was almost blind, but he really did see with eyes of faith that which was unseen. So think about Isaac. He knew the promises of God. He knew what God had said to him. What about you? What has God said to you in his word? Has he given you promises? Yes, he's given you many promises. He's given you promises for your life on earth right here and right now. Grace, his grace is sufficient for you. You can enter his throne room and ask for mercy and grace and he will give it. And he's given you promises for the future, for heaven, for rewards. No more pain, no more tears, no more sickness. How can you pass on the blessings, the promises that you have already received? Like Isaac did. Tell your children, bless your children, pray for your children. Tell others, pass it on. We don't have a pie in the sky optimism believing in something that's not real. We're not just wishfully hoping that there will be better days. We have the guarantee from God's word that the best is yet to come. That's one of the major emphasis of the book of Hebrews. The next award goes to Jacob and he is going to receive the award of prophetic faith. Jacob did the same thing that Isaac did. He blessed his sons as he believed that God would keep his promises to Abraham's descendants. Jacob had seen a lot of frustration and grief, frustration in his family, frustration with his father-in-law, grief regarding his sons, but he didn't forget God's words to his grandfather, Abraham. So Jacob's blessings on his sons were based on the promises of God and they were prophetic. 
Jacob spoke by faith and the blessing that he gave, the prophetic blessing is in Genesis 49. I want to mention a couple of things that he talked about by faith, things that he would not see. The 12 tribes of Israel, a king over the land, the ultimate reign of Jesus Christ, the lion from the tribe of Judah. And it was in that blessing upon his son Judah that he said, the scepter will not depart from Judah until he who until he comes to whom it belongs until he comes is the prophecy of Jesus coming as king. So Jacob knew that he was coming. He prophesied that he was coming. We know he came and he is coming back. Joseph receives the award of absolute faith. He had no doubt. He never let go of God. I've called this absolute faith because if he had based his belief on his circumstances, he certainly would have had to have thought that God had changed his mind mm -hmm. and wasn't going to do what he said he was going to do. But Joseph held fast to hope in God. He clearly held to God as the anchor of his soul through everything that he went through. He walked by faith. He turned from evil. He turned away and ran away from Potiphar's wife. He trusted God and waited on him while he was in prison. He forgave his brothers for their actions. And then Joseph made his own funeral arrangements and planned for his bones to be ready for travel when Israel would finally go to their own land. Years ago, when I, my family, we, my husband and I were selling our first home, it had been on the market for a long time, but I started packing up the dishes and packing things up. We didn't have a buyer at all, knew the house I wanted to move into, but I remember my sister-in-law was surprised that I was already packing up, even though the house didn't have a buyer. That's kind of what I think of here with Joseph. He made his bones ready for travel. He's like, do this with them. Take them because you're going to leave this land. What was required of these faithful saints? In every situation, walking by faith required a sacrifice of self, a denial of self, something about themselves. They had to let go of. Think about Abel. His faithful worship cost him his life. There are martyrs who have lost their life because of their faith in Jesus. Enoch's faith cost him the approval of the world as he walked alone with God in a desperately evil age. Noah's working faith cost him disappointment. He had that great big ark and only seven other people got on board with him. Abraham's test cost him the sacrifice of Isaac. That's what God had demanded of him. I can only imagine how sickened he must have felt. Just gut-wrenching grief, being overwhelmed as he climbed the mountain with Isaac as he prepared to sacrifice him. He went all in with his sacrifice. He held nothing back. That's why God approved and he passed the test. And then God did graciously spare Isaac. So we must acknowledge and accept that walking by faith requires denial of self or denial of something that the world might tell us that we should keep or we need. Again, we have to know that God has something better in store for us. And it's not just better. It's the best. And that's the conclusion that we see at the end of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 39 and 40 say, All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. So what's the book of Hebrews all about? It is all about faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. 
He's better than anyone or anything. And I have given you on the back of your handout a list of all the verses that say something about trust. Jesus trusted God. Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. And there are some verses there about unbelief as well, because that's the wrong thing. And then lots of verses about faith where we're being encouraged to ha put our faith in Jesus. Remember the way that things seem to be right now are real, but they're really short. Right now is temporary. The way they are now are not what they will be later. So let's praise God for all these ordinary, everyday people of old who were just like us and had faith in the one true God. We can give a round of applause to these faithful heroes, but give a standing ovation to our God, our extraordinary God in whom we put our faith. We've received the better thing, forgiveness and perfection through our faithful high priest. And that's why we can walk by faith now faith by faith let's go do it let's pray lord god our father on your throne we're not unknown callers to you <laughs> you know us thank you for knowing us and knowing our needs and you gave us these examples and you know exactly what you're going to do in our lives you know how to grow our faith and test our faith and um, show yourself to be faithful thank you thank you Jesus that you have walked a life of faith you are our faithful high priest you are our help on high we want to walk by faith and please you so help us deny ourselves say no to sin turn from evil fear you appropriately love you worship you let our faith be seen by others as our faith in you who are unseen is true and real just thank you for your word your promises to us, Lord. Keep holding on to us, and we are holding on to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.